When walking through a grocery store, we expect food to be certain colors. Oranges are orange, salmon is pink, and pickles are yellowish green. But what if I told you that this isn't necessarily true? Unlike candy or cereal, we assume that the color of natural foods are a result of the environment. But some aren't actually the color we assume. That's because the government plays a key role in determining the colors of your food. And for that, we can thank the margarine wars of the late 19th century. In the 1860s, butter was expensive. Without refrigeration, the product spoiled quickly. In response, the French invented a cheaper alternative called margarine. It was made by churning beef tallow, a form of animal fat with salt and milk. Margarine was a similar tasting spread, but was less expensive and took longer to spoil. But unlike butter, margarine was white, the color of lard. So, manufacturers added a yellow dye in order to appeal to consumers' palates conditioned by the color of butter. By the 1870s, margarine was flying off American shelves. Meanwhile, butter sales were falling. So the American dairy industry launched a propaganda campaign against margarine. The campaign published articles citing the use of dangerous ingredients and used obscene cartoons depicting the wretched conditions of factories. In 1886, the government passed the Oleo Margarine Act to appease butter manufacturers. It permitted the coloring of margarine, but aimed to restrict sales by adding a two cent tax per pound whether it was colored or not. The act marked one of the first instances in which an industry pursued government intervention in an effort to stop competition. But this wasn't enough for dairy farmers, and they continued to seek government legislation. By the end of the century, 26 states had enacted anti-color laws that completely prohibited the coloring of margarine. Some states went as far as making manufacturers dye margarine pink so that consumers could discern the difference in products. In 1902, the federal government took it a step further and added a 10 cent tax on artificially dyed margarine, while the tax on naturally colored was reduced to a quarter of a cent. In order to avoid the tax, margarine producers started using vegetable oil as a natural dye and even sold color capsules along with the white margarine so that consumers could color it at home. The margarine wars were coming to a close, but the war on food dye was just beginning. In 1906, the Food and Drugs Act banned the use of harmful coloring without labeling to conceal damage or inferiority. The government certified seven colors for food use not only because they were considered harmless, but because they were heavily used. However, the use of them was not required. Manufacturers could still use uncertified colors as long as they were labeled in the ingredients. And American consumers still bought them. If we didn't use coloring, your, our food products would look a lot different than they look. It may affect people's decision whether to buy a food product or not. But in addition to that, colors can also be used as a way to enhance uh, flavoring or, or more importantly, to enhance uh, freshness. What we see on our plate determines how we taste. During one study by the British researcher J.C. Wheatley in the 1970s, participants ate steak and fries in a dark room. Subjects stated the food tasted normal, but midway through the meal, Scientists turned on the lights to reveal that the steak was dyed blue and the fries green. Many participants became ill or lost their appetite merely at the sight. The experiment showed how our brains can alter the taste of food depending on our perception of color. In the early 1900s, the USDA began setting grade standards for the external appearances of certain foods. For example, no more than 4% of peas in a can of canned peas could be discolored. And in order for apples to be graded as US extra fancy, 
they must be colored 50% striped or partially red. These grading standards determine the quality of food based solely on appearance. But throughout this time, journalists continued to uncover more harmful properties associated with dyes and ingredients used in food, drug, and cosmetic products. Then, in 1937, disaster struck. A Tennessee drug company began advertising the benefits of a new drug to treat infections. But the product was untested and was found to have toxic ingredients after over 100 patients died. The newly created FDA quickly enacted the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. And unlike the 1906 law, only the use of certified dyes would be permitted by law. Regulations continued to strengthen, and the list of certified colors was frequently updated due to safety concerns. There are nine certified colors that are approved for use in the United States. And the FDA has a chart with those nine colors. And these colors are prominent across the food industry, even in foods you may not expect. When you think about the color of typical pickles in a jar, you probably picture a bright yellow-green color like these. Although pickles are naturally green, this bright hue is the result of food dye. Yellow dye number five and six. This dye keeps skin from fading while on shelves. Uncolored pickles, on the other hand, are much less vibrant and look like this. Now, what color do you think of when it comes to oranges? Obviously the color orange, right? But that isn't always the case. In warmer climates, ripe oranges are actually green. And many residents of equatorial communities have never even seen an orange orange in food stands. Only in cooler temperatures does this green pigment die off, revealing an orange color. However, consumers in these areas associate green with an unripe fruit. So in order to make oranges sellable in the US and European market, farmers in warmer states like Florida, where 70% of the US citrus supply comes from, and Texas often artificially dye them orange. However, the dye is banned in California and Arizona. Salmon is another unsuspecting food that relies on dyes to make sales. Unlike wild salmon that is naturally pink, farm-raised salmon is naturally gray. The meat from wild salmon is pink because their diet consists of naturally pigmenting compounds from krill and shrimp. But farmed salmon are fed food pellets with astaxanthin, an FDA-approved dye in order to turn them pink. This is because consumers have been shown to prefer darker shades of pink and will pay up to $1 more per pound for a darker color compared to lighter hues. Fish is a huge problem when it comes to deception. You've got fish that's caught in Alaska, for example, sent to Asia for manipulation, sent back to Alaska, and then, in, and then sent to the States for consumption in sushi bars. Some wheat breads, cheeses, and others contain dyes as well. By regulating this kind of uh, food coloring uh, or the use of food dyes, government is trying to protect people's health by stopping the introduction of uh, harmful substances. But at the same time, this kind of regulation was adjusted so that this regulation does not affect the food industry in a devastating way. They don't want to ban or prohibit any, uh, all of the synthetic dyes or prohibit the entire food coloring process. Today, some companies are experimenting by slowly removing synthetic dyes from foods. Instead, they're moving towards the less vibrant natural dyes. For example, Subway recently stated it would stop using artificial dye to color banana peppers and use turmeric to maintain the bright yellow appearance instead. And Panera Bread removed the use of dye in its mozzarella cheese, which turned it from having a bright white color to a yellowish hue. 
The standard the government uses is a reasonable standard. So they don't have to be foolproof, 100% proven safe, but they have to be shown to be reasonably safe. So we allow these little exceptions to the 100% rule, you know, no risk rule, in order to accommodate a modern food system of having foods that are manufactured in different colors and taste and a variety of foods. But the problem with that is beyond just the questions of deception and safety, is the question of, is this the kind of food system we want? 